Any, anyone, who, a, anyone who follows Tehelka's journalism knows who our heart beats for. I mean, we've been always pretty clear about it, that we seek to be <coughs> the voice of those who don't have a voice. We seek to be the voice of the powerless. We seek to be the voice of the wronged. That's the mandate written into the very founding of Tehelka. That's the code of Tehelka. At the same time, what makes my heart sore, and I'm going to say this very openly, I've said it, in, in, I've written about it, I, I, I'm absolutely captivated by great entrepreneurship. I think entrepreneurship shapes the world. Everything that we enjoy, everything that we have, the planes we fly, the cars we drive, the televisions we watch, the food we eat, everything is driven by an act of entrepreneurship. The world is created by entrepreneurship. And so this kind of easy dismissiveness about entrepreneurship as it can be about politics is very misplaced. It's very narrow. Uh, I think mostly a lot of it often even stems from envy. But today we stand at the cusp of a very difficult time. In the last 120 years, since the world began to globalize and open up in difficult ways and the old ways of colonialism died, we've, we've tried and been through several kinds of, of economic models. We had, we had communism, which, which flourished for about 40, 50 pretty grim and disastrous years in several parts of the world. We tried socialism, which in India, I still believe, set the roots for, a, the, for, the, for the creation, the very plinth for creating a modern nation. Very few people realize that we, when we became independent in 1947, 340 million people, we had nothing. We had 90% illiteracy, we had no manufacturing, we had absolutely nothing. We were absolutely the poorest of the poor in the world. When the founding fathers set out, they had to pick. There was great pressure from the great Western capitalist countries, including America, for us to e just ape their model, buy their goods, ape their model. But at that point of time, far-reaching men and women decided that we needed to build a plinth, we needed to build a base, we needed to build a certain kind of uh, bulwark against being swamped by just foreign goods and foreign materials. And so there was a period in the 1950s when we were uh, what we, we would call maybe a, a socialist state or a welfare state, but it was actually a mixed economy. So there was a bit of entrepreneurship, though it was controlled and it was, a bit of, it was quite crony. And then there was the state trying to, trying to invest and build a, 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 a plinth for the country. We should have shifted gears by the time we hit the mid-60s. Nehru died in 1964, then came Shastri, then came Mrs. Gandhi. But I think somewhere there, we missed a beat, we missed a step. We had set the plinth, we should have freed up the energies of India's entrepreneurs. We didn't do that. It took up till 1991 for that act, act to happen, by which we were really, we had lost many precious years. Uh, but the socialist state has also been discredited in the last 100 years because the socialist state, because of the pathologies of men, it has nothing to do with any, any, any one community. It's a universal pathology that, that men and women will be selfish at the end of the day, that human beings will be selfish. They will work the hardest and think the hardest when they are motivated for the self. But part of that pathology also is that men and women also rise above themselves and are, get, 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 get deeply linked with and create great synapses with collectives. So this is a kind of, these are, these are, these are dual parts of the same pathology. So socialism failed in a way because it, it completely factored out the idea of individual interest and, 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 in, and in individual effort in a sense. On, Capitalism has now, as we speak, we've been seeing a great kind of question mark on the, and we saw the morning session where both Pratap and, and, and uh, Tom were very, very eloquent. We've seen capitalism under assault now because now capitalism has reached a point of rapaciousness. Now people feel that capitalism actually is taking way too much. A, a disproportionate share of the world is being taken away by it. Today I have with me here three pretty much uh, leading entrepreneurs of India. They've created vast business empires. I think they all run into billions, some into tens of billions. Uh, the, 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 the question that I actually want to pose to them is that as the world changes, as communication changes, as, 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 as it becomes no longer possible to just conceal your wealth or hide it away, as questions are raised about you, what is the kind of entrepreneurial DNA what kind of entrepreneurial metabolism are you going to be looking at, 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 at now uh, uh, absorbing and passing on to your, your corporations and to your companies? I'm go I have with me Rajan Mittal. I mean, everybody here knows Rajan and Sunil Mittal. They've created what is one of the biggest telecom companies in the world. 
Uh, in fact, the, the truth about the great telecom revolution is not just that we all have mobile phones, 600 million people. It's the incredible multiplier this has put into the economic activities of this country. Uh, they've also lived through a very difficult phase in building the empire in India, and I'd like him to talk a little bit about that too. What is the difficulty of entrepreneurship today? How the state should respond? And what his own journey has been and the lessons for the way they need to shape their idea of the business in the future? Rajat. Thanks, sir. Uh, let me also put in perspective, uh, as you said, politician as a word and corporate leaders as a world today is kind of, I would want to put a disclaimer to it. Also, I must say somewhere, somebody's got wrong that this is like a fixer's riddle. Corporate guys are neither a riddle, neither, well, I, neither I, a fixer. Let me just make a clarification there. It, the, the title of this uh, session was meant to be the problem fixer's riddle. And problem fixers being, we saw men, men of means and money as problem fixers. But some editor at some point said, this is too long a title and made it the fixer's riddle. So, <laughs> so this, this is the that, problem that fixer's well, riddle. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know how many people in this hall have to have kind of reset their life or reset the switch. We see as entrepreneurs, India pre-90, post-90. They're two different worlds. As we got our independence in 47, I always call that a political independence. The economic independence came in 1991. By default, not by design. And this is where it gave an opportunity like entrepreneurs like us who started, I, I come from a political family. So coming from a political family, going and becoming an entrepreneur in this country can be very challenging, very difficult. It's easy to say, and I, I have to say, especially in a country in India which was actually in the formation stages, where rules, regulation, regulators, nothing was there in the early 90s. It was extremely challenging, and especially telecom, which is a regulatory industry, uh, more sober, where there are many uh, parameters which need to be set and reset. It has been challenging, it has been difficult, but also very rewarding. It's not about creating a telecom company, which is a large telecom company. The joy is really when you see the empowered, that fisherman or a farmer, uh, a couple just spoke about that, I think that's something which is really gratifying for entrepreneurs and for a corporate like us. Not only that, the kind of GDP growth that is happening in this country on account of telecom is huge. Nobody's measuring it, but the World uh, Bank statistics says 3% of telecom growth is about a percentage in GDP, and that's huge. 1990, I mean, I, I know in this hall there are many other people who would kind of know this. When Diwali used to come, we used to look for the telephone man because we wanted to make sure that what he was wired in his head, he only knew how your telephone worked. <laughs> you wanted to call him, give him Diwali gift, and he would come appear on your door because that was his right. Now, that is a changed world today. Here I am going chasing everybody, the whole telecom world. That is the change. That is the power of change that has brought to this country. So it's not only about what corporates do. Corporates are supposed to do that. People talk about the corporates are making wealth. They are generating wealth, they're creating wealth. There is a huge difference between money and wealth. When you're employing 50,000 people, hundreds of thousand people who send telecom across the country today, look at the proliferation of the wealth that is taking place. One has to understand that. It's very easy to say, it's very easy to debunk the corporates and say, you know, you look at your balance sheets, look at your market caps, but they are out to help the whole society at large, especially the kind of businesses that we are in. It is touching lives of the common people, and that is where it is most important today for governments to be facilitators. Governments have a role to play. In a country like us, which has seen socialism uh, 40 years, it's a young country, even younger economic uh, kind of economy that we are living in. Governments have to play a role of facilitator. It's a given, they must. And entrepreneurs must play a role of creator of wealth, creator of wealth not only for themselves, but across the uh, country. Thank you. You, know, you, you've also been the FICI president, uh, Rajan, so I mean, I also want that macro view of, from you of what is it that you would like to see corporations doing and absorbing as a kind of value system today as the world changes and, you, you, and, and, the, and the hunt for a more equitable society ga gathers force. I think it's very important, especially a country like India where we have 1.2 billion people and there are people in every parts of the society Inclusion is a must for a country like India. We cannot see that there is a, a class which is getting much more richer and the class which is not. Though the statistics clearly tell us since 1990 till now, which is about 20 years, 
the growth for even people who are below poverty line, as that is called, is improved. Their lifestyle is improved. Of course, the aspirations are far greater. Media is in your face. You are connected 24 by 7. We have played a role in every village. Today you go, you're connected. It's important that the inclusive growth happens. And for that, I think the, the model that India needs to adopt is a public-private partnership. Without that, it's not going to be possible. If we believe that we sit here and sermonize and say governments have failed, I think we have failed as well. Because we have not gone joined hands with the government. So a public-private partnership in education, basic health care, sanitation, there are many people who not even lives have not been touched. We have a role to play there. So clearly, if I would say the corporates need to step up and say we're going to play a role in these areas with a public-private partnership where there is accountability. Governments have huge role to play. They have huge funds to deploy. But unfortunately, I have to say, they are not deployed the right way or they do not percolate to the bottom of the pyramid. This is where we are going to play a role. That's uh, Prashant, uh, in, in many ways, you're, you're a second generation entrepreneur and uh, uh, in many ways you're, the spread of your, the companies that, that you, you all helm is quite fantastic. It has a, wide, it's a very wide range. What are the challenges of building a kind of value system in the new world order in a, comp in a wide range of companies deployed from one end in, in, in telecom investments to the other end in mining? It's a very wide range. So what are the challenges you face and what is it that you internally debate in terms of facing the future? Yeah, I think uh, principally uh, in terms of the sectors which we are, we are, we are covering, obviously telecom uh, is something which we've been intricately involved with for a long time. Uh, we've exited that recently. But in the oil and gas space, uh, in the power space, uh, uh, and in the steel uh, space, again, all basic needs of the country. And Firstly, I would like to say, to agree with, with, with Rajan, if you look at where we were in the 90s, and you look at where we are today as a, as a, as a nation, in all of these basic sectors, India is largely self-sufficient. Uh, if you take, uh, telecom obviously is a great example, but if you take the steel sector, you take the oil and gas sector, uh, you take the power sector, all of the basic manufacturing. And most of these basic manufacturing sectors have been built by the, by the domestic entrepreneurs. You really don't see too many large multinational corporations in any of these spaces. They are all pretty much at the front end in the consumer-facing uh, space. Uh, you know, you take the Cokes, you take the Pepsis, you take the Levi's, you take all of that. But if you take the basic manufacturing, that's all been built by the domestic sector. Obviously, uh, regulatory and clarity of regulation is, is something which all of these sectors uh, face. We've come a long way since the early 90s uh, till where we are today, and I can, I can say that we, we are running businesses now in, in the US and Europe, other parts of the world, and if you look at the regulatory framework which we have today, it's not that very different. Uh, I think we have some more space to, to go in terms of the actual execution, the proper execution of all of that, of all the framework which is in place. But if you look at the broad framework, it's, it's there, but we need, as entrepreneurs, I think we need to get used to the new, the new, you know, the new framework, the new, the new way, uh, of doing business, the, the environment, uh, you know, the environment requirements, the mining uh, requirements. But if you look at it broadly, the framework is there. We need to implement it. We need to get used to it. But we need the development in any case. We can't let that prevent the development of the country. But, but tell me, do, do you have, Prashant, moments of disquiet about the kind of questions and challenges that are being forced? Do you find yourself saying, we need to figure out a way of doing this in a more humane way? We need to figure out a way of doing this in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a more sustainable way. Are these conversations dogging companies like yours at the highest level? No, these conversations are certainly uh, pretty up there in terms of our main discussions taking place today. Yeah. Today, the questions when we are looking at investments in the past, the question was whether we have a market, whether we'll be able to raise the financing, whether, we, you know, those, uh, the profitability of the business, I think today we've also got, you know, how is this going to affect the environment? How are we going to deal with the people who are going to be affected by in the areas which we are, which we are developing? And what is, the, what is the plan which we have to, to deal with these issues? I do believe that despite all the problems which people are, which we, we keep talking about, a lot of these projects are getting built. And a lot of these plants are coming up. Uh, we don't talk too much about that. We only talk about the one or two which get stuck. But uh, there are many which are happening. Uh, I mean, I can tell you that uh, in all of the sectors which we are talking, uh, we have built capacities which when we talk anywhere internationally, other than China, 
because China is always something where you know we are a fifth of China in, in, any, in, in, any, any, area. in any area. But if you keep China out, then, and then if you compare what India has done in the last 20 years in all of these sectors, it's quite mind-boggling. Uh, Katie, you, you had a, your, your trajectory is a little different from both uh, Rajan's and Prashant's. Rajan is a first generation entrepreneur, Prashant is a second generation entrepreneur. You are again a first generation entrepreneur, but you're already in a phase of transition. You're trying to transit into a public space, into politics. Uh, what, what is it about the entrepreneurial journey that's now kind of pushing you into a very obvious public space of, of being politically engaged? Is it that you are now tired of entrepreneurship, you don't wish to do it anymore? <coughs> or, or is it that you see it as a natural transition for an entrepreneur to also be a public figure? See, I think um, the natural uh, transition for an entrepreneur, the entrepreneurship is all about uh, creating something. He's a first generation entrepreneur, I'm a first generation. He comes from a political family who's transitioned into business completely yes. now. I come not from a business family and not from a political family. So getting into uh, business, getting into entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship is all about having an idea, create, then trying to put that idea uh, into reality and trying to make all the stakeholders uh, happy. In entrepreneurship, the stakeholders are um, limited, identifiable. So as we were uh, discussing and uh, we were seeing last day, uh, yesterday about the inclusive growth, the tribal leader from the Jharkhand. So the, the inclusive growth which the public, uh, with the, which public is looking out for today, so the stakeholders are increased, say they, are, they have increased now. So in this light, the entrepreneurship uh, satisfaction at least as far as I'm concerned. When I, I started, uh, I'm pre-90 and post-90 because I started somewhere in 1981. So as Rajan rightly said, that there's a difference in pre-90 and post-90. But in this journey, many times I came across uh, the systems which, which I, it'll be hypocritical to say for all of us if we say that we never compromised uh, the systems, we, we are part of the system. But many a times uh, during the journey, I felt that this was not right. This was not right. If I was uh, in a position, uh, I would not uh, let this happen. Today, um, you know, it's, it's a moment. That moment can come to anyone at any time. So with me, this moment came when I thought uh, that I must uh, now get into space where I can, where I can where I can make the difference, where I can go out and uh, fix those things which, which were not fixed for me. So therefore, this transition. So I am very happy with the transition, and I want this transition to happen now. Rajan, as a, as, as a corporate philosophy, tell me, as we speak today, have you seen your own, in your own company over the last 20 years that you've struggled? I know there was the era of Beetle phones, and there was the whole flogging of all those things the great troubles, the success, and the continuing troubles, you know. Uh, has the political philosophy, I mean, the, the, the corporate philosophy of the company altered in any way? Is it different today than what it was, say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? You know, I think uh, corporates have to be, you know, reinventing themselves. You have to innovate. It's an evolutionary process, especially how the dynamics of this country work, uh, both internally and externally. Uh, when we started in the early 90s, uh, it was quite very different. The mindset was different, it was very challenging. We were a tiny company uh, to, a, to an extent that I, I must uh, kind of, you know, one of the meetings that I went, uh, one of the multinationals, a big a telecom giant, along with one of the blue chip Indian companies, you know, kind of buttonholed me and said, uh, when will you be ready to sell? Uh, please call us. Uh, because that is bound to happen. Uh, this business is for deep pockets. Well, good part is we, I never knew that this is for deep pockets. But that triggered a kind of situation that you just can't walk into a country and you know, start making an entrepreneurs and telling them how the world works around us. There was a world which looked India very differently. And it is being looked now very differently over 15 years. The challenges are different. The competition in this country is intense today. Never in the world that you will see 14 players in telecom. But probably things will come around, the, uh, the, the new regulations which are coming around. Things will change. And Indian companies today, the Indian business model today, 
is what is being actually taken in the outside world. Uh, the legacy networks like Vodafones of the world are today worldwide wanting to look at the Indian models and say, this model is doable. At one cent a minute, where do you find this business model? It also is challenging because you have to sustain that economies of scale, which would mean that you need to not only grow in India, but you also need to grow outside. So what is it about this business model, the Indian business model that is now exciting international? You know, Indian business model has actually turned on its head, you know. Earlier there were legacy models as we used to call it. We went in a different model which actually created a model which allowed us to really expand in a horizon that was never seen before. Uh, all our partners, today vendor partners as we call them, are really doing stuff which they've never done across the world. Now that model has allowed us to expand, not only in India, but even outside. Uh, we've gone into Africa, uh, 18, 19 countries. We deal with a whole lot of people from Democrats to dictators, but the business model in telecom remains the same. At the end of the day, people want to talk more. Uh, M Health, commerce, everything is there. Is it challenging? They're on extremely challenging when you go outside these markets. But one thing I have to give credit to India, if you can drive in India, you can drive any part of the world. <laughs> T tell me, how are you making, as a company, you're a huge corporation with a, with a blue chip brand and name today, how are you making a synapse with everything else that is happening in India? Because today a corporation is not just a money-making machine, it's actually at the heart of all kinds of change. It's at the heart of societies, not just as politicians are at the heart of societies, great corporations are the heart of societies. They will, in some sense, end up inflecting how a society will go or how it will shape itself. In that, what, do, do, do you, at the very highest level, Lou Sunil, Liu, uh, uh, do, do you talk about what your role can be in these things? Is, is that something in your head? Is that something happening? I think as business leaders, we have a role to play. As I said earlier, uh, the political, the civil society, media, and, and the corporate and the business leaders, they all have a role cut out for themselves. A uh, whole lot of people talk about CSR. We are a very young country for that matter. People talk about US. Look at US economy and look at the US how it has been structured. The laws have been structured. In US, the wealth tax takes 90% of your wealth if you have not really, so what happens? There are the foundations which will do work. In India, even to create a foundation, even to take money into your own foundation, you cannot do it because half of it is taxed, other half you can use for uh, capex or opex. The laws need to change. And I think if you see in the earlier uh, times in India, the Bedlas, the Tatas, there was a lot of people who were doing stuff for social work. And then in, in, in between years, I think we played a role which was negative. People started taking tax breaks. Eventually, government had to step in to say, hey guys, stop it. I think it's back uh, uh, to a different corporate leaders. We want to play a role, particularly in uh, people like us, we are playing a huge role in education. Today, I, I have a, you know, about 200 schools which teaches about 40,000 rural kids, especially girl child. Really? Yeah. And we're working, and, and everything is provided to them, are these, and high class education. Are all these schools entirely funded by Etel? Completely funded by not only Etel, but my family foundation, which we have sold some equity to put in there to run these schools. So they run completely from computers to uniforms to midday, everything. And unfortunately, I have to say, that you have a school right next to it, which has been there traditionally, the government school. You don't find a teacher there. There are no kids going there. Is so this is still here? Yeah, yeah I'm sure. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. But this is where we are wanting the partnership to happen between government and corporate leaders who are accountable and who want to give back to the society. There's, there's a kind of statement we'd once made in Tehelka that it's not only important how, how much the wealth they give back to society, but it's also important how the wealthy make money from society. Oh, I'm saying, is that also a, an area of concern? For example, mining is an area of great concern. I mean, what's the, what's the corporate thinking in your own company on, on the whole business of mining? So we, the broad thinking, uh, not only in mining, but in all assets which are owned by the government, which sooner or later will be given out to the corporates in one form or the other to develop, whether it's mines, uh, whether it's spectrum, whether it's various things. I think the broad thinking is uh, an open, transparent, public auction process is probably the best thing both for the government and for the corporates. Because at the end of the day, the corporates also are not interested in, in you know, getting an asset which is not, and not paying what it's actually worth. I, I think there's a, uh, the, the business case has to be getting a mine at what it's worth and then developing it 
and making something out of it. If that's the business case, then I don't think there is any corporate, certainly not, not us, who would be willing to pay exactly what it's, what it's worth. And, and therefore, a public process, uh, a transparent process, is something which we would welcome. And I think in any case going forward, based on what's happened in the last year, it's something which will happen uh, in any case. In this process, uh, Katie, do you, do you uh, do you feel that the the, the government and the and the, and and the, and, the, and the public partnership is that the kind of best way to more, go forward? I mean, which means you bring in the energy of the individual, and you bring in the unbelievable resource of the state, and you kind of make a marriage, which ends up being a creative marriage. Now, since you're somebody who works on both sides of the fence, do you see this as actually the real way forward? where you pull in the creativity and the energy of the individuals in India. And there is, you know, great hunger. I mean, there's an entrepreneur on every street, if you know that, yeah, you know. <laughs> you know, India is an entrepreneurial nation. And, 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 and is, is the sluggishness then really coming from the government side? That's correct, because uh, I think that's the only way, as uh, Rajan was also mentioning, public and private partnership. A classic example of the school, uh, the school lying next to their school is the government school where nobody goes. So the public-private partnership is the uh, best answer. The government should not be in the business of business. So we have to encourage the entrepreneurs to come up and uh, handle the resources. And of course, we need uh, to have a transparent system where the national resources are handled uh, in a transparent manner. And, and how, how do we rely? This is a question to all of you. How do we bank? Sh should society just bank on the sense of right and largest and goodwill of the rich? Or should it be almost a kind of mandated act that, that those who have a disproportionate amount of wealth, even if they've created it themselves, ought to have, have, have be mandated to be giving back a certain amount to society in indirect and indirect ways? The definition of giving back can be very subjective. Uh, corporates uh, are supposed to be in really managing what they are supposed to do. And once you're creating employment, that itself is giving back in a way. People don't realize or people don't think. They believe that's the way it should be. That's fine. So I think there are facets. There are things that we need to uh, you know, give back to society in many which ways. But I, I would say that corporates are not here in, in a sense to say that we are only going to do this job because this is a pretty sexy word in the, in the world and you look very decent. Our job is really to create wealth at the bottom of the pyramid. I think that's our job. And if we can do that, uh, that's something that we would have achieved. Look at today the rural India. You look at any company from telecom, FMCG, 60% of our growth is coming from rural areas, not from urban areas. Now that clearly is showing, and the innovation that is happening. People are not even looking at those innovations. Today, I don't even remember how many villages, they don't have any electricity. We go and put a tower there, which has a generator. So what is being done now? The generator is actually giving power to that village while it has to run 24 by 7 and for its own, you know, beaming the uh, radiation. Now, keeping that in mind, the village has been lit. Now, is that not really giving into the society? In a way, it is. And I think at the end of the day, government and, and industry have to come together to make sure the natural resources are well auctioned. It met, it, that money which goes to the government must be put into the areas which India requires today education, skill development, uh, health care. So all that, what comes, is actually needs to be spent there. See, that's a new model. That's a new model which he's talking about. It's not, it's not socialism, it's not capitalism. So if we have to give any ism, this is Indianism. You know, like RTI, uh, which I think, I don't think that there is any other country which has the yeah, RTI yeah. Act, where you have the right to information. Similarly, I think uh, Indian entrepreneurs like Rajan, uh, mm -hmm. people like them, I'm not counting people, me counting out because I'm in the transition. So people like them, they are giving a new meaning, a new meaning of inclusive growth. So if this is the... So, so, so sh shall I, con no, I, sh shall I conclude, uh, and I'll come back to you uh, for what you want to say, because uh, as we were lucky to have Kapil here just before us, and we were trying to ask him about the approaches of the government and the bureaucracy, which continue to in some ways be antiquated and, and sluggish. Is that a problem that you face all the time, even when you wish to do some, uh, a project that would benefit a larger mass of people? Yeah, I, I think firstly, uh, you know, one of the other inputs which I would add to what Rajan was saying is that India is still at a very early stage of development. We still require huge amount of capital to be reinvested to provide the basic services like power, like you know, all of the basic things, telecoms, uh, and, 
And if you look at the investment pipeline which we need to, to put in over the next 20 years, it's, it's really a, a huge number. Huge and if, so I don't think we can really compare ourselves today with where the US is today. They already have most of the basic, uh, all of the basic infrastructure developed. So I think as corporates, the, really, the role is to make sure that we are able to provide these services and make sure that if you, know, if, if you have 60 million tons of steel today and, and China has 750 million tons of steel today, then even if we can get to 200 million tons of steel, which is what the country would need in the next 10, 15 years, we, we have the capital, we reinvest that capital in a cost efficient way to provide those services to the people. So I think that's one big, along the way, obviously, uh, creating huge amount of jobs is, uh, comes with it. I mean, just a group like ours, for example, we, we today employ 70,000 people directly, another 100,000 people in, uh, indirectly I mean, as contractors to our, to our company. So I mean, that comes along the way that, 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 goes without, that goes without saying. And of course, there is a very large uh, element of development uh, around the places which we work in, in the areas which, you know, environment, uh, et cetera. I mean, to talk about policy, I mean, clearly we, we are going through a transition. Uh, I don't, it's, it's, it's certainly slowing us down a bit. I mean, I'm not going to say that there's, there's, no, there's no slowing down. But at the same time, we are still able to go out and build uh, any very large, very large projects. Uh, I think if you look at the US example, ju just take one more second. If you are building a mining project in the US, when you enter, they'll tell you, look, you need two and a half years to get all your permits, and then you plan three years to build the plant. Now, in India, we try and do the whole thing in three years' time. And that's where the problem is. I mean, we can't do it in three years' time. We have to accept that, look, it's going to take two years to get all your permits, and then it's going to take three years to do the project. And as long as we are mentally prepared for that, and we can plan our projects on that basis, I think certainly uh, you know, we are in a position to build world's, world scale projects to meet the country's requirements. Rajan, quickly, one, one, uh, the, bells, the first bells rung. I'll uh, quickly, just a summation of, of what you see as, as your horizon, your destination over the next five to 10 years. You know, both as a company and as, as the company's own synapse with the larger Indian reality. Now, let, let me take a larger perspective of India, really speaking, and that's more important than my own company or the companies that are representing here. I think this is our turn. These 10 years belong to us. This is India's turn. Our time has come. And this is where people like us, people like you who are in the media, people from the political and civil society need to sit together and not waste this 10 years. World is going through crisis. US is still fragile. <laughs> Europe, Europe, we know what is happening. There are really two countries, they are really Asia. The velocity has moved here. Uh, when President Obama was here, I had met a whole lot of business leaders, and most of them were cribbing and saying, what is this? He's come here to take business out of us. He's making speech back home for his constituency. I said, I am a very proud Indian today that a superpower comes to India and is looking for jobs back home. This is a proud moment as an Indian. So I think we are at that uh, cusp that this can really change for the generation next. We all need to come together. And policy making, my only, my only one humble submission here to the policy maker is, don't keep on changing policies, which we have to keep unwinding it. That is a struggle that Indian entrepreneurs have. It. You go uh, you know, to the extent, and then the policy rewind happens. Newer policies are being introduced. Uh, you know, just to give an example, people say that 2% is mandatory for the corporates on social responsibility. This discussion has happened over a year. Now, my issue is, is this relevant? Because the moment you plug in that 2%, trust me, in my balance sheet, there are many people who read my balance sheet from the lower panchayat level to a, a, a MLA level saying, come and say, you guys are not spending. It's time that we need to make a deal. I don't want that. Allow me to do that. It is my job. I'm as much as an Indian as you are, policymakers are. So I think it's our turn. We should not let it go. The next 10 years belong to us. Prashant, <laughs> what, what, what? Do you, do you share the same horizon and vision? I think, yeah, I totally share the same. Uh, it's a huge opportunity which we are sitting on. Uh, and uh, I mean, as, as, as Rajan said, world, worldwide, the focus is here. If you look at it about a year ago, till actually till President Obama made the trip to India, India was absolutely at the top. I think we've lost some of that sheen in the last, uh, in the, in the last one year. But, but the basic uh, you know, basic development and growth which we are seeing in India is, and the demand which we are seeing in India is still very much there. And so I think we need, again, from a, from a corporate perspective, from a business perspective, uh, we see the next 10 years as significant growth opportunity and ability to, 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 to build 
and and participate uh, in the indian cop in the indian story kd the only thing which i can tell these guys that uh, what you are facing everyone us everyone of us has faced so it reinforces my desire to go to the other side of the fence <laughs> and to make sure i do not know uh, how successful i will be but i can um, permit me to end it with a couplet i say manzil to mil hi jayegi bhatak kar hi sahi manzil to mil hi jayegi bhatak kar hi sahi gumrah to wo hai jo ghar se nikle hi nahi <laughs> so we'll try it out Okay. Thank you, thank you, Rajan. Thank, thank you, Prashant. Thank you, Kedi.